a welcome to the International Institute for Strategic Studies. And what I've just confirmed is our first public meeting since presumably February 2000 and wait, when did this start? 2020, is that right? For a long time. So, so I'm a little bit out of practice. I mean, obviously, I've been doing me, I've been sharing meetings on Zoom, uh, but actual people are a delight, and um, so thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Dana Allen. I'm uh, editor of our journal Survival and a senior fellow here at the IISS. Um, and our meeting, of course, coincides with the UN uh, Climate Conference in Glasgow, which, uh, you know, as part of a broader effort, constitutes what I think it is fair to say is the most ambitious effort, arguably in human history, to um, privilege international cooperation and particularly international environmental co cooperation over all the myriad reasons, over conflict in general and myriad reasons uh, not to cooperate even short of conflict. And it seems to me it kind of stands to reason that success or failure uh, in this endeavor uh, will include success or failure of many regional efforts to sustain cooperation in the face of conflict. And one of those conflicts um, amid many in the Middle East is, of course, the Israeli Palestinian conflict. Uh, the Oslo Accords of the 1990s uh, contemplated areas of practical cooperation, very much including water. And I actually just Googled it to, to, to remind myself and found an Annex 3 um, that stated that the two sides agreed to establish an Israeli Palestinian Continuing Committee for Economic Cooperation focusing, among other things, on the following. And there are seven or eight things listed, but the first is cooperation in the field of water. Um, and then goes into detail about that. Um, the um, NGO that is being presented here today, uh, Ecopeace, Ecopeace uh, was founded, as I understand it, um, right after the Oslo Com Accords, or soon after the Oslo Accords, it comprises Israelis, Jordanians, and Palestinians working on shared environmental issues, uh, including those associated with water shortages. And it's run by three co-directors situated uh, respectively in Amman, Ramallah, and Tel Aviv. And we're, we're um, privileged to have two of those co-directors speaking to us today, um, one in, in this room, um, and one from Ramallah, if I'm not, mis if I'm not mistaken. Um, from Ramallah, we have Nada um, Majdalani, who's the Palestinian co-director of EcoPeace. Um, she's a practitioner, researcher, consultant in the field of environmental management, um, and uh, has had leading technical positions in various projects in the area of infrastructure development, including water, uh, wastewater, and solid management. Um, and she's presented her ideas, including some, I think, some of what we're talking about today before the Sec UN Security Council, NATO, and the US Congress. Um, she will be preceded by the gentleman to my left, uh, Gideon Bron Gideon Don Bronberg who's the Israeli co-director of EcoPeace Middle East, uh, based in Tel Aviv, um, who equally uh, speaks regularly on these issues um, and has uh, been very active in uh, you know, conveying this project and, 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 and associated issues to the corporate bodies of the international community, if I could put it that way. Um, and they're here to talk about something that um, was put, a pun I almost didn't want to include in our invitation, but I understand it is uh, what, what the project is, uh, a Blue New Deal. Is that right? A green. Uh, a green blue do green, new yeah, deal. See, green you, blue deal. You see why I didn't even want to, <laughs> it, it's one layer of complication too much, even, even for me to remember it. But yes, the green blue new, new deal, which is 
the Green Blue Deal. No New Deal. Yeah, you see, I'm, I, I, I messed up the pun. <laughs> but it is a very serious project, um, which we'd like to hear about now. So thank you um, uh, very much for the invitation to speak here at this uh, prestigious uh, institution. Um, very, very grateful for, for hosting us here. And I also want to uh, express our gratitude to Rick Rove, uh, who's flown in from uh, the United States uh, as a uh, both a, a member of the IISS and of the International Advisory Committee of ECOPEACE. I also want to highlight uh, Rabbi Frank at the back, who's also a member of the International Advisory Committee of ECOPEACE, and uh, Sharon Bengio, who's the Government Relations Officer uh, uh, in the Tel Aviv office um, of ECOPEACE as well, who, who joined me in coming out uh, to Glasgow um, a week ago. And congratulations to the UK Government for organizing such a, um, an important and effective, and let's hope that the results uh, at the end of next week will, will satisfy uh, the urgency of the needs here. So I'm going to start with the presentation and sort of stop in the middle, and then uh, and Nada Majdalani, um, uh, uh, the co-director of Equipeace in Ramallah, uh, will continue. Now, the first slide um, actually speaks to the launch of the Green-Blue Deal. Uh, no, let's go back. Uh, 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 last year in, in 2020. Um, the Green Blue Deal is really inspired uh, by Europe, by the European uh, Green Deal and uh, the efforts of the Biden administration in the United States to move uh, uh, forward the, uh, the fight against climate change. Um, uh, the, the work that, that we're presenting here is work that we've actually undertaken for uh, uh, more than two decades. Equipeace is 27 years old. Um, uh, and, and much of our work uh, we've reframed in light of the knowledge that we've gained over this last decade as to how the climate crisis um, uh, uh, is both a threat multiplier, uh, uh, if, if we think of the serious situation we're under, how much more serious it's going to be, but perhaps even more importantly, as a multiplier of opportunities. And that's really what our work is about. Because we're always looking, we're solution-oriented in Equipeace. Uh, from our three offices, from our three countries, we uh, reject the status quo. Uh, we want to see a better future for all of our peoples. And we believe that the four pillars, I'll present two of them, and Nada will present the other two, are relatively low-hanging fruit to help us move forward, uh, both in the fight against climate change, but also to advance the two-state solution um, uh, between Israel and Palestine that at Equipeace we strongly support, and uh, a regional inter integration as part of that, that, that has to, of course, in include Jordan and uh, the broader Middle East as well. We call it the Green-Blue Deal for the Middle East, although the focus of this presentation and of this uh, particular work is really all looking at Israeli-Palestinian uh, Jordanian issues. Um, we have a real champion uh, today in this effort, His Excellency uh, uh, Pekka Havisto, the Foreign Minister of Finland, who spoke um, uh, at, at uh, the launch and has really uh, uh, helped us to take this issue on, and, and, and Nada will expand on that. Um, Dan Shapiro, who was the former U.S. Ambassador uh, to Israel commented um, uh, at the annual conference where this report uh, was released that this is a potential roadmap, that he saw this as a roadmap for the Biden administration as to how to advance both uh, 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 climate resilience for the Middle East and the two-state solution. Next slide, please. So uh, the MENA region, with, with the map on, on uh, your left, um, is already the most water-scarce part of the world. There is no other uh, region in the world that is as water-scarce. We don't have rainfall uh, for most of the months. In fact, for most of our region and so for the eastern Mediterranean, the rainfall is very focused on a few months. And for the rest of the month, it's naturally dry. That's the way uh, uh, the climate conditions uh, 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 developed. The map on the right highlights the conflicts in the region. Now, there's not a direct relationship between uh, the water scarcity and conflicts, but there, in most of the conflicts, 
there are underlying indirect relationships that relate to water scarcity that help feed conflicts throughout our region. Next slide, please. When we look at um, uh, what the scientific community, and we're very science-based, what the scientific community are telling us, this is uh, some research done uh, by Tel Aviv University and a German uh, university in cooperation back in 2018, um, that things are going to get a lot worse. Um, firstly, while the rest of the world is so rightly fearful of a one and a half to two degree increase in temperature. We've already experienced a two degree increase in temperature since the 1950s. The temperature of the Mediterranean Sea, where I live on, in Tel Aviv, reached 32 degrees Celsius this summer. That's two degrees higher than the record it had ever shown. The average is 29, 30 degrees. In the sea, it's a hot bath. Well, now it's even a hotter bath um, in the month of, of August. What the climate models are, are showing us that by the middle, the, the, the middle graph, we will no longer have any rainfall in autumn. We don't get a lot, but we can expect no more rainfall at all in the autumn months. And the bottom graph shows us um, roughly that, that there's going to be a 50% increase in uh, the summer months, um, a, a, up to a 40% decrease in precipitation, and a further increase in temperatures of depending on where uh, in the MENA region, of from four to uh, seven additional degrees, beyond the two that, that we've already experienced since the uh, 1950s. Next slide, please. Um, now, we also think that, that um, it's just not right, it's not helpful to look at the climate crisis just from a national perspective, because the climate crisis doesn't impact a specific nation, it impacts a region as a whole. And in the Eastern Mediterranean, we are a climate hotspot because of you know, uh, uh, the data and the IPCC have, have indeed identified. It's much more helpful to look not at necessarily geopolitical maps. These, this is a map that you're not familiar with, perhaps. This is a map of watersheds. And of course, the watersheds make a complete mockery of the divide between Israel and the West Bank and Israel and Gaza and Israel and Jordan and the West Bank and Jordan. I mean, the, the watersheds show us really how we're going to have to manage um, uh, adaptation efforts if we're going to survive, because we, we know that the, the changes are real, they're already happening, and we're going to have to respond to them. The, the big um, uh, uh, green uh, basin that's listed there, uh, Yarkon, um, the Yarkon River Basin in Hebrew, starts in Ramallah and ends in Tel Aviv. It really shows us that we are one unit. If we don't manage that basin together, that we're not going to manage it uh, at all. Next slide, please. Um, when uh, uh, f the first um, uh, pillar of the Green-Blue Deal, um, and as I said, there's four, um, uh, is, is, uh, w was really based on work that, that we launched in 2014, completed in 2017, and we asked the question, um, of what can we learn from other parts of the world? And we looked at Europe again, and we looked at the coal and steel arrangement of, uh, of Europe after World War II. And, and we asked, well, okay, well, what's brought stability, and how has that been related to those very initial coal and steel arrangements? Coal and steel, of course, were the most important natural resources of the continent last century. And the coal and steel arrangement brought cooperation over those two critical natural resources. Next slide, please. And then we asked the question, well, what are the two critical natural resources, again, of the Levant uh, that, that can help bring stability to meet the needs this century? And our research highlighted that it's all about harnessing the sun uh, through renewable energy and harnessing the sea through desalination. And perhaps we can learn from the experience of coal and steel in Europe and create healthy interdependencies around harnessing the sun and the sea. And our research highlighted that Jordan has the comparative advantage because of its vast desert areas to be producing renewable energy at scale and at prices that the rest of the region, certainly Israel and Palestine, can't compete. Um, 
uh, Israel looks like it has the Negev in the south, those that you're familiar with it, but the Negev is captured. Half the Negev is military training areas, the other half are declared nature reserves and where the Bedouin population live. Um, Israel is only at 6% renewable. It's struggling to find the land because the land is taken and uh, there's going to have to be real changes in planning and zoning that would allow Israel um, uh, to uh, uh, further uh, uh, move forward on renewables. Um, the West Bank and, and, and Gaza, well, the, you know, the, the, the situation for the West Bank is that Israel controls 60% of West Bank areas and um, is not facilitating uh, investments in renewables uh, for Palestinians. And Gaza is so heavily populated, there's no room um, for any serious uh, uh, renewable energy production there. On the other hand, uh, both Israel and Gaza uh, on, the, on, on the Israeli and Palestinian coast have the comparative advantage of being on the Mediterranean in close proximity to all the population centers. So it's about 100 kilometers from the Mediterranean to Amman, Jordan's capital. It's also 100 kilometers from the Mediterranean to Irbid, Jordan's second city. Um, uh, Jordan has a sea at the very bottom there is the Gulf of Aqaba and Ilat, um, but it's 300 kilometers to Amman. It's 400 kilometers to Irbid. Um, and, and therefore the cost of desalinating for Jordan um, in the south is double to three times the cost. And our study highlighted that um, if um, uh, uh, desalinated water, preferably produced with renewable energy coming from Jordan, um, uh, is moved uh, uh, east to, um, uh, uh, to Jordan, uh, water in Amman can be supplied for $1.20 instead of 3 to $4 coming from the south. And in this way, um, we uh, are proposing to create healthy interdependencies where for the very first time, each side has something to sell and each side has something to buy. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, and in that way, we uh, can help create region-wide water security, region-wide energy security, um, uh, uh, help create, promote regional stability through the economic cooperation that is led. And as Nada uh, will speak at the end, um, also facilitate uh, uh, Palestinians obtaining their water rights. This is not instead of a fair allocation of natural waters as well. Next slide, please. Um, so some of the, the details that, 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 that we see are already deep in planning. We're no longer just talking. There are serious discussions taking place um, uh, uh, that, that look to be extremely promising. Um, uh, where uh, uh, the fields in Jordan for, from the renewables can uh, move west. At the moment there is no linkage of electricity lines. Uh, between Jordan and Israel, but there is now a willingness. And when we started, when we issued our report in 2017, we did not, we were not received with open arms, let me put it that way, um, from uh, the Ministry of Energy uh, in Israel, who had, who had bad experience um, of, a of a gas pipeline uh, that was blown up constantly by ISIS in the Sinai that was uh, supposed to supply gas to Israel. Um, uh, so there had been some, some bad experiences of, of, of trying to be dependent uh, in the neighborhood on, on another country. But once Israel increased its commitment from 17% renewables by 2030 to 30%, and the Prime Minister of Israel just this week uh, declared in Glasgow 100% renewables by 2050, it's clear that Israel doesn't have the land available to meet those commitments if it doesn't buy. And now public statements are being made. This is no longer an equity statement. These are statements of the government of Israel that are keen to buy renewable energy produced in a neighboring state and publicly state, preferably from Jordan. That's how far the political will has moved um, in a very short period of time. And it's not out of generosity. It's out of a sense that this is, this is a, an issue of survival, an issue of meeting uh, the international uh, commitments. Um, and uh, what, what does exist is that there is a 
uh, a connection between Jericho, uh, uh, between South Shuna in Jordan and Jericho um, in Palestine. And here too, um, uh, there's uh, already agreements uh, to increase the quantity of electricity sold from Jordan to Palestine, to the West Bank. Um, uh, there's, uh, at the moment, the, the electricity is mixed. Jordan's, uh, Jordan's uh, renewables is about 20% of their mix. Um, so there's a 20% inclusion there. Um, but our vision would be that there would be 100% uh, renewables from Jordan that would be um, uh, uh, sold uh, to uh, the Palestinian grid. Next slide, please. And on uh, the water slide, on, on the water side, you can see, this is my last slide before I turn to Nada, you can see that um, uh, the blue dots along the, along the Mediterranean are the, uh, desal the existing desalination plants in Israel. Um, uh, very important to understand that 70% of Israel's drinking water today comes from those five desalination plants. The dependence on the aquifers, the coastal aquifer along the coast, the mountain aquifer shared between Israel and the West Bank, and the Jordan River system are no longer seen as reliable because of the climate crisis. And um, uh, uh, there's been a, a heavy investment since 2005 in uh, desalination um, uh, that has uh, also uh, uh, developed in extensive uh, technology development. So um, you know, 20 years ago, the cost of desalination was at about $2 a cubic meter. Uh, it's down to 40 cents in the latest uh, uh, tender and the latest um, uh, plant that's being built in Surek and will probably go down to 35 cents when the Western Galilee um, uh, desalination plant uh, starts to be produced, uh, the, the, one, the red one uh, at, the very, at the very top. In fact, Israel's planning to triple um, its desalination capacity from its, its, its current production um, to meet uh, Israel's needs and, and uh, the planning is, is also considered to meet regional needs um, right, from, right from the outset. Um, the, the potential of moving water west and again this is no longer an echo piece statement. Israel and Jordan just signed an agreement two weeks ago. It was in all the press. Uh, the largest water sale in the two countries histories. 50 million cubic meters beyond the peace treaty commitments. And again, it's not out of generosity, it's out of necessity. Because Jordan, Amman, uh, uh, this summer, was receiving water eight hours a week. There is no 24-7 uh, uh, water supply. And Nada will go into that in, in Palestine, but also in Jordan. And without that, that uh, purchase of an additional 50 million cubic meters of water, the Minister of Water of Jordan uh, had, told, had warned the public that water supply would be cut to just once every two weeks. So you know, every house has a canister on, on their roof or um, a, a cistern uh, underneath their house to store water until the next time the municipality provides. And I, I think Nada will, will delve into that. Now, um, uh, uh, because of the climate crisis, um, uh, we've had in the last 20 years, 15 years of drought. And, and during that drought period, um, the Sea of Galilee, uh, uh, or the Kinneret in Hebrew to the north there, um, uh, reached the historical uh, uh, low where the future of the sea as a freshwater lake uh, was at risk. And because of that experience, uh, the Water Authority uh, of Israel decided to invest a billion shekels to reverse the national water carrier. That is the pipeline that comes out of the Sea of Galilee um, uh, comes towards Tel Aviv and then splits to two pipelines that, that bring water down uh, to the Negev. Um, in its heyday, that, that uh, system brought between 350 to 500 million cubic meters of water. Um, uh, today, Israel is reversing the system to bring desalinated water to the Sea of Galilee. It's the first that we know of, of climate adaptation, of desalinating in order to save a lake, and this is just not any lake, Perhaps, want, perhaps the most famous lake on, on the planet, or one of them, um, and critical as, as, a, as a source of, um, of, of at least water security. Um, but that, that now presents the opportunity to really move water east, because there is a pipeline, and you can see it on the map, 
a pipeline connecting the Sea of Galilee with the King Abdullah Canal that runs parallel to the Sea of to the River Jordan. That's a cement canal. That's how water currently is being supplied. And therefore, the second aspect of the water uh, of the of the Green Blue Deal that we're proposing is to stop using pipes and canals to move water, but to start rehabilitating, taking the sewerage out uh, that's currently flowing in, in, in the Sea of Galilee, uh, sorry, in, in the, in the uh, lower stretch of the River Jordan from the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea, and moving the fresh water, or the desalinated water mixed with Sea of Galilee water as a means to also rehabilitate the River Jordan, um, another um, uh, uh, river with a reputation larger than uh, than, than the quantity of water that, uh, that would naturally flow. Um, and that enables us to meet a second major objective uh, of, of climate resilience, would be to bring back uh, the river biodiversity, 50% biodiversity loss. Um, uh, because of the demise of the river, we can now bring that back and um, uh, uh, generate uh, new jobs. Um, with a dramatic reduction in precipitation, we're going to need to you know, re-evaluate our economies because economies, and particularly the Jordan Valley, based on agriculture, um, are going to struggle where that agriculture is based on rainfall. So um, rehabilitating the River Jordan is the, is the potential to introduce uh, 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 new economic opportunities, particularly around tourism. There's about a million Christian pilgrims that come every year to be baptized. Only a million, this is the third holiest site uh, to Christianity in the region, and only a million Christians uh, uh, come each year, and it's mostly because it's not an attractive site. In fact, it's a little bit of a health hazard to be baptized in the river. Um, it, it's, a, uh, it's a shame, it's, it, it's, a, it's a real shame on the names of our, uh, of our countries in the region to have uh, uh, led to such a demise. And now we have the potential um, uh, to rehabilitate the River Jordan. So I've gone way too, too long, and let me uh, turn it on to, uh, turn it, uh, to Nada Majdalani to continue from the next slide, please. Thanks, Gidon. Um, uh, and, and building up on what you just said, uh, there is great opportunity uh, today to not only restore uh, the system of the River Jordan, um, and to improve the water supply for communities across the border, um, but there is really here a, uh, an opportunity for uh, in improving uh, the, the political tension um, and, and to deal with the water issue as a low-hanging fruit uh, and as, as a trust-building measure between the, the parties in conflict. In conflict. Um, and, and particularly because um, water issues uh, during the Oslo Agreement, as Dan mentioned, um, were put as one of the five final status issues uh, between Palestinians and Israelis to negotiate about uh, during the five-year interim agreement, uh, which basically assigned water with uh, many difficult other files and associated um, solving the water uh, issues um, with basically solving uh, everything else around it, including um, East Jerusalem status, uh, the issue of the borders of the Palestinian state, um, the issue of the uh, settlements and Israeli settlements in the West Bank, and the right of return of the Palestinians. Um, all very difficult files, and indeed they uh, are interconnected with um, uh, with prejudice, value, uh, uh, political uh, agendas, etc. Um, however, when we look at the water issues um, uh, 25 years ago, they only produced winners and losers because what was negotiated about is basically um, natural water resources um, that are only available either through the River Jordan um, or the shared water aquifers, and as we can see from this, from the screen and from the um, map, uh, there are several um, underground water aquifers uh, which are being shared between uh, Palestine and Israel, and uh, Palestine, as well as Palestine and Jordan. 
Um, and, and the main uh, aquifer that we're speaking about is the mountain aquifer, of which um, uh, most of it is located uh, in, uh, in the Palestinian uh, West Bank areas, but um, also uh, a lot of it is being, um, or 85 percent of it is being utilized by Israel. Uh, so there is uh, definitely a great uh, a dilemma in terms of the allocation of water resources, um, including also, for example, the eastern aquifer, of which um, is somehow entirely located uh, in uh, in the Jordan Valley, um, and of which um, uh, also it yields around 80 million cubic meters um, per year, and. Um, uh, according to the Oslo Accords, it was supposed to, 40% um, of that is uh, utilized, um, or 50% of that is uh, to be utilized by Palestinians, and the other 50% that is utilized by, uh, by Israel and Israeli settlements in the area is to be um, uh, transferred to the, uh, to the Palestinian communities. Um, so, however, during this past uh, 25 years, um, the water issue remains the same. Uh, the water quantities that have been allocated uh, during Oslo um, for the Palestinians of about 200 million cubic meters have not been fully attained um, and, and um, taken by the Palestinians uh, to be utilized for communities. Um, and instead, at the moment, uh, there's approximately 80 million cubic meters of water plus uh, sometimes, depending on the season, being purchased uh, from the Israeli water uh, company uh, to basically supply uh, communities in the West Bank and Gaza. Um, and therefore, for, for Palestinians, the water issue is very much connected to sovereignty and the ability to build a future Palestinian independent state. It is one of the key elements um, for any state to be able to sustain itself uh, in terms of public health and in terms of economic growth. And uh, what was basically assigned as quantities 25 years ago is not corresponding to the current um, demographic growth of population, uh, but also the economic growth aspirations, uh, particularly for um, the agricultural sector in Palestine and uh, the industrial sector as well. Um, for example, uh, in terms of economy uh, and, and as an agricultural sector, uh, 25 years ago, the um, uh, percentage of, of uh, agricultural contribution to the Palestinian GDP was approximately 14%. Um, and to that, today, it only corresponds to 3%, um, which uh, shows how much the farmers community and the agricultural sector is actually suffering um, from water shortages in the area, uh, both from climate change and because of political reasons. Um, uh, what we are proposing as an echo piece uh, for, uh, for future consideration and for current consideration is basically to prioritize negotiating about um, uh, reallocating water, uh, uh, water uh, natural water resources uh, between Palestinians and Israelis and to uh, fulfill uh, a fair share of water for the Palestinian communities um, and some sort of uh, independence and, and sovereignty over these water resources but also to contribute to another uh, approach uh, which is different from the Joint Water Committee uh, that is very much now governed by uh, um, by the, the veto of um, of yes or no to either digging new wells or to developing uh, existing wells, um, and and therefore we are looking into a more fair approach in terms of managing shared water resources, a more fair approach in terms of um, sharing information of the status of water aquifer and the pumping rates from each side in order to uh, manage in a healthy way um, the water available uh, from, from nature resources. And this is basically a low hanging fruit and it's doable because of um, the increase of the water quantity and the water pie
which Hegel has already mentioned, that is going to be achieved by increased desalination uh, on the Israeli side and also on the Palestinian side from the shores of Gaza, which would guarantee that the Palestinians would get their water share and water rights without actually affecting um, the quantities of water that are um, uh, that are available to the, to the Israeli citizens. Um, we do recognize how much sensitive this issue is. Um, we do recognize that, at least for the Palestinian side, maybe we're going to speak later on the Israeli perspective, um, that the connectedness of water with the other issues, um, with the, the issue of refugees or borders, is also very much connected to the political status. Uh, we do recognize that um, the borders of the Palestinian state constitute of parts of the River Jordan, uh, the Dead Sea, um, water quantities uh, for potential refugees who will come back needs to be accounted for as well. Um, the status of East Jerusalem, who will supply water for these communities. Um, we do understand the complexities, but we do also see the practicality and the side uh, and the practical side of achieving uh, some sort of agreement and um, and uh, working points towards achieving an agreement on water issues um, as a trust building measure for the rest of the more complicated issues. Um, next slide, please. And why is this important? Uh, also, Gideon has, has mentioned, water needs to be in every home uh, and uh, available for, for communities to continue their daily lives. Um, many communities in the south of the West Bank receive uh, water uh, once every two or three months during the summer season, um, during the drought season. Uh, they. Um, uh, they receive approximately 23 liters per capita per day, which is way below the um, average uh, standards for the World Health Organization. Um, the average per capita in the West Bank and Gaza is approximately 60 to 70, which is, uh, again, not sufficient enough. Um, and uh, basically what communities tend to do is they buy water by tankers and private vendors, and this is um, extremely expensive. Uh, it could cost uh, families double their uh, income and salary uh, of the household to basically uh, purchase water uh, uh, for, for, for the families of an average of five to six people in the homes. Uh, it could cost uh, up to um, $200 sometimes per month uh, to basically supply water to these families. Um, so as the situation is really dire, and it goes uh, similarly uh, with uh, with Jordan, as Egon has mentioned, um, and therefore it is very much necessary to address this issue as an immediate uh, need and response. Um, and uh, uh, and as I mentioned, it's not only for the political gain, but all to basically address the immediate needs of the communities. Next slide, please. Uh, on another uh, note and another issue that is also governed by the current um, uh, approaches and management systems between Palestinians and Israelis when it comes to water is the transboundary water streams, uh, which naturally they should carry um, a storm water, but uh, at the moment they are polluted by raw sewage. Uh, mostly from uh, Palestinian uh, communities towards the Green Line, uh, where it crosses the border towards Israel, um, and it gets treated on the Israeli side. Uh, and the cost of treatment and construction of treatment plants in Israel is basically deducted from the Palestinian taxes. Um, there are several impediments where Palestinians cannot construct their own uh, treatment plants. Um, the, the first one is, um, uh, is connected to the lack of funding, uh, the lack of available land, um, and sometimes impediments by permitting procedures from the Israeli military, um, and also due to uh, the hesitance of the uh, fun uh, financing community 
uh, uh, to, to support uh, large infrastructure projects uh, due to uh, the inability of some institutions to run these complex, uh, to complex um, uh, uh, infrastructure projects. Um, however, as ECOPIS, we keep pushing forward the agenda that the Palestinians uh, have their own treatment plans and that they utilize uh, reuse treated and they reuse the treated water to every single drop in agriculture. Uh, similarly to what Israel is doing at the moment, uh, they reach up to 75% to 80% of their agriculture is dependent on treated wastewater. Um, and uh, we have uh, definitely uh, mobilized our communities and advocated with our stakeholders to push forward some key uh, uh, wastewater treatment plans that would uh, address uh, transboundary wastewater uh, 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 streams. And one of them is basically the Hebron Wastewater Treatment Plant. Uh, and it's uh, hugely now being constructed um, uh, to, to resolve um, a, a very pressing issue, which was um, agonizing both sides on the Palestinian and the Israeli side. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, basically, um, it's not only that uh, we would like to see further improved mechanisms for, uh, for transboundary wastewater uh, and, and its issues of polluting also um, uh, shared water aquifers and water resources uh, and the pollution, the pollution that also occurs on agricultural land uh, on, on both uh, uh, areas and fields. Uh, but also uh, we would like to address um, some proper mechanisms of early warning systems uh, towards uh, extreme weather events and floods that uh, basically um, uh, take uh, uh, threatened lives of, of people uh, across the border. Uh, but basically most of these uh, threats are happening uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the Wadi Gaza. Um, and what we're looking forward is to organize and to um, uh, facilitate communication and data sharing um, to basically save lives uh, just because the, just before the catastrophe happens. Next slide, please. Um, on another uh, 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 route or track, uh, and the fourth uh, track of the Green Blue Deal is basically our educational um, educational uh, uh, program, uh, which uh, in the last four years um, is. Uh, targeting thousands and thousands of students. Our target until the end of this round of uh, our Good Water Neighbors project is around 22,000 uh, students and youth from Palestine, Israel, and Jordan. Uh, we target youth from uh, 17, 16 years old. Uh, we provide them with training courses, uh, field visits. They understand the realities of their, uh, their, their water uh, issues and their neighbors' water issues, and they try to simulate um, their, uh, their realities and put themselves in the shoes of the other. Um, it's important to learn these issues in order to uh, build the understanding of activism on ground and, and, and community engagement. We build not only the knowledge, but we also build the skills uh, for our youth to become agents of change within their communities. Um, at the same time, we also train lots of teachers so that they also convey these messages uh, on climate change, climate activism, and water issues, um, and, and transboundary water uh, cooperation uh, through their uh, school classes. Um, on the other hand, we also have uh, the Young Professionals Program where we teach also um, uh, young professionals on motor diplomacy, uh, uh, green social entrepreneurship, and we encourage them to come up with um, a joint projects uh, and we try to advance them for further funding. Um, uh, we also provide uh, support to uh, schools uh, and at the moment we are finishing up the third school in Gaza Strip with providing it with solar panels, uh, wastewater treatment uh, units, and uh, rainwater harvesting.
existing systems. Uh, and for some other schools, uh, we're planning to supply desalination units for uh, existing wells. Um, we, we want to also have the students not only understand uh, uh, the things the, uh, theoretically, but also to see solutions in practice and be part of the solution um, uh, for their communities and for, uh, for, for them also to endeavor um, uh, seeking potentially careers in environmental issues and, uh, and technology that would bring solutions to their communities. Um, we also have a fantastic eco park uh, where we hold our educational activities in them, but also we host uh, tourists who, whoever would like to um, have some quiet time in the northern Jordan Valley in, on the Jordanian side. They are more than welcome to visit our eco park, uh, which is fully environmental, fully powered by solar with a wastewater treatment unit um, and very good food. Um, and finally, we also, uh, our bottom-up approach engages with, um, uh, with community leaders and with, uh, with, with mayors. And we utilize our youth to basically, uh, in the communities, to basically encourage their mayors and community leaders uh, to, uh, to take on uh, cooperation on nuclear issues and environmental issues on their agenda. And this is um, a, a picture, as you can see on the far left, far far right of the slide of mayors jumping into the Jordan River in the clean, clean stretch of the Jordan River to send a message to the world that they are united towards cooperating on water issues. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, uh, there's a lot of uh, work still needed to engage international community. And as Guido mentioned, we have our champion, Pekka Hausto, uh, who's the uh, foreign minister of Finland, um, and who is um, definitely engaging with our foreign ministers to advance uh, further um, a meeting uh, between the three parties to advance our Green Blue Deal. Uh, we've been engaging with several um, embassies and foreign offices and um, foreign ministries across Europe uh, to uh, basically uh, take on some of the uh, elements of the Green Blue Deal, either for advocacy support or even for financial support. Um, and uh, we have uh, definitely addressed these issues um, and these elements of the Green Blue Deal to the higher political level uh, of the uh, uh, UN Security Council in 2019. And we're hoping to keep advancing in the engagement of political, uh, uh, of, of international community uh, towards further facilitation uh, for, this, uh, for this deal. Um, I'll stop here because I think we've, uh, we still have a lot to say and to answer uh, in terms of questions. Great. Well, thank you both uh, very much um, uh, for a really stimulating and inspiring um, set of presentations. Um, a housekeeping note, uh, I think w this meeting is advertised to go until 2.30, which is 10 minutes from now. Uh, and obviously, any, uh, I, I think we're gonna, I'm going to try to push it possibly a bit longer until three for those who want to stay. Um, I'm with the full understanding that some of you can't stay or, and, and please feel free to get up and don't worry about interrupting and head for the door if you need to. Um, but um, in the meantime, uh, I'm, we'll probably extend a little bit, somewhat beyond 2.30. Um, Two things I want to do. First of all, is um, I want to um, reiterate what Guidon said um, about the key role of Rick Grove in organizing uh, this meeting, which um, Rick is a great friend of the IISS, um, and I also know a great friend of EcoPeace, um, and um, so his his role in sort of bringing the two together should be mentioned again. Um, and let me just start um, while people are thinking about um, responses or questions with 
a couple questions of my own. Um, the first one is a somewhat narrower one, but I'm just curious um, if I understand correctly. The desalin des desalination, desalinization or desalination? Desalination. Desalination on the scale that is needed according to your projections and is planned according to, or is actual and planned, is that utterly dependent on the Jordanian source of solar solar power? That you know, I'm, I'm just wondering if that is, um, if I understand that correctly, or if there are other plans for providing the energy that would be needed. Um, and if there are other plans, would those or other possibilities, would those not be um, climate friendly? Um, my second question is. I mean, is, is an awkward one possibly, and also maybe even an ignorant one, but, um, and, and a broader one. Um, and I, I say awkward not because I'm afraid to ask awkward questions, but because it's obvious that the scale of this human and you know, social and environmental problem involving water and the future of the climate in the region is just huge and is an issue in its own right, leaving aside politics. But I wonder about the politics. I wonder if you might talk about, either of you might talk about this a little bit longer, because you know, as someone who's followed um, Arab-Israeli and Palestinian-Israeli issues for a while, um, there's obviously, in regard to, to you know, post-Oslo discussions, um, there's obviously been a kind of competing, competing paradigms, um, one of which, one paradigm in part has been associated with what might be called the bottom-up paradigm. And I could have this wrong, but in my mind, it's sometimes associated with uh, figures like the Netanyahu government. In other words, you know, as opposed to the idea that you don't you concentrate on um, practical uh, bottom up issues such as yours um, and put off this pesky problem of, of political self determination. Um, and so, where does this project do you think? I mean, you've presented it as a kind of bottom up project that should move both should move all, well, I shouldn't say both sides, all three sides forward. But is there a possibility it could be looked at in, in the other way, if you see what I mean? So, so who would like to start? So, so perhaps I'll start with um, the desalination. So, so the desalination plants on the Mediterranean are powered by the grid. And as the grid in Israel becomes more uh, sustainable, more uh, uh, powered through renewables, whether that renewable energy comes from Jordan or comes from uh, within Israel itself, then the, uh, uh, the, the sustainability of that desalination uh, will improve. Right. Because you know, desalination is energy intensive. Um, that, the, that's one of the major criti uh, critiques of desalination is how energy intensive and currently it's overwhelmingly powered by fossil. Um, so there's a need. And of course, the more that can be purchased. In our study, um, we recommended uh, uh, that 20% of Israel's uh, renewables would be coming from Jordan. The discussions with the Ministry of Energy are actually beyond that. Mm -hmm. Because Israel has increased its, its commitment so significantly to 100% renewables, it's going to have to probably purchase more than 20% from neighboring states, um, uh, Jordan being the most attractive and I think most uh, geopolitically important to do so. I also want to highlight that we have here Ruan from the Jordanian Embassy here in, in London um, that is also very, very knowledgeable on, on these issues as well. Um, uh, let me pass it on to, to Nada to start first perhaps on, on the politics, and I certainly have lots to say too. Thank you, Kizan. Um, definitely the politics uh, is very complicated uh, in terms of um, creating the political will to move forward with the initiative. Uh, it requires a lot of, of patience, it requires a lot of engagement, um, uh, building, the, building the understanding amongst 
constituents and uh, and and educating them about the issues. Uh, it takes uh, a lot of effort and it takes a lot of patience. Uh, it needs to address um, uh, also uh, the stereotypes that are uh, and and the tags of similar organizations that work across the border. Uh, we are often accused by uh, you know. Uh, by, by several other organizations and activists that we are either normalizers, that uh, the Palestinians are normalizing with the, with the occupation. Uh, for Gidon, uh, they are tagged as, um, as traitors because they're working uh, towards uh, also working with Palestinians and improving things on ground. Um, so it's definitely a very fragile situation, particularly that uh, during the past years and during our work, we have never seen uh, uh, any advancement uh, in terms of the political uh, will to advance on the political side. Um, and every time we try to move forward and, and make a, a step forward, we are hindered back 10, ten steps back um, because of uh, certain political turmoils, uh, and you name it, we have We've gone through the uh, second intifada. We've gone through several uh, wars in Gaza. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, survived the the era of Trump and annexation. Um, these are these are events that are externalities for us. They're they're uh, not under our control. But what is under our control is basically our uh, stamina, our our patience, and that we keep pushing our luck, um, working with communities and working with uh, with constituents and, and stakeholders uh, who could be the champions of um, uh, of our um, uh, uh, concepts uh, of of regional cooperation, um, and basically. Um, now there's there's no choice, and we do see also people who have opposed uh, some of our concepts in the past, particularly prioritizing negotiating on water, for example. Um, um, several years back, when we launched this idea, um, several p p politicians and also water experts from Palestine they said that never this shouldn't happen. This is very much connected to the other political issues. But today, because they see the climate change impact and the pressing need for communities to get um, more water shares, um, they have uh, basically released an initiative to start pushing the Palestinian leadership to ask for prioritizing and negotiating on water rights. Um, this doesn't come from you know uh, from uh, from outside the the spectrum of the effort that Ecopeace has been doing all over the past years to work with people and to convince them that this is the right way forward. Um, so, as I mentioned, very fragile situation, but we keep um, trying our best to uh, to promote what we stand for. Thank you. Good on you wanted to add. I, I just wanted to add on, really on, on a little bit of, of what Nada said is that for 27 years, the all or nothing paradigm has moved us to nothing. Because if we condition moving forward on everything, and of course Nada and I and everyone in Ecopis wants to move forward on everything, we wanted to move forward on everything 27 years ago. But we haven't. I mean, our governments haven't been able to, you know, uh, whether we like it or not. And, and, and therefore, we would argue that. It's no wonder that the public of Israel, the public of Palestine, have no faith. Because their experience for the last 27 years is that nothing has moved forward. Well, nothing can move forward if, if the paradigm is that everything must move forward. So given 27 years of failure to move forward on everything, we think that we're absolutely justified to take that risk. And it comes with risk. And we recognize that risk. But um, it is justified to move forward on what looks like the low-hanging fruit, not as a favor, as Nada said, to improve the reality on the ground, to show the public on both sides, on all sides, and Jordan also here is very important, to show the public on, in Jordan as well that there is a partner for peace, that we can improve the reality, we can um, uh, uh, see things move forward on one issue, and if we can move forward on one issue, 
then what excuse do our governments have not to move forward on the other issues as well? Thank you. Um, comments, questions from the floor? Well, when, when you say one issue, are you talking water or are you talking about the environment? Well, we're, partic we're, uh, a lot of water there. we're particularly focused on, uh, on water as, the f as a final status issue. So, you know, uh, uh, by moving forward on the advancing Palestinian water rights, which is one of the five final status issues, we're moving forward on, we're, we're calling on the governments to move on, uh, forward on something so concrete. And that's the potential game changer. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, Gigo um, and Nara. So since 2017, this has really gained traction. <clears throat> and do you see, I suppose this is my challenge from within the advisory committee, a future role for EcoPeace in two key issues? One is challenging uh, the owners and operators of the systems to critically evaluate the environmental results of desal on this scale, that is, raise water temperatures and the chemistry of what's left behind. And two, this is um, Rachel Haverlock's uh, argument in her latest book, um, is that the ownership and governance of the companies running this stuff, rather than being, say, you know, big monopolies, for example, how, how can EcoPeace challenge the situation so that there are bodies really serving the interests of the public long term in terms of stability, rather than short term profits and I suppose that's the Marxist argument. You know, the, the short-term interests of the investors involved. I, I, I'm happy to take, um, to take that, given the Israeli experience on desalination. Um, so although the, uh, uh, the desalination will be improved if it's solar, uh, the, I think what Frank is referring to is the brine. Um, the extra salts that are being dumped into the Mediterranean. And if, if we're talking about one desalination plant, so be it. But we're talking about many desalination plants, not only in Israel, Cyprus, Greece, Turkey, Egypt, Gaza, clearly, uh, are all discussing large desalination facilities because the region is running out of water, much due to climate change. Um, uh, that remains an unanswered issue. And there needs to be a lot more investment to see how those salts, rather than being dumped back into the Mediterranean, could be used as something useful, and perhaps for building. Um, uh, and, and here, you know, European, Middle East uh, uh, research could take place to see how um, uh, that could come, that could come, take place. Um, I think the other. Um, important feature not only of the desalination but of the renewables so desalination on the Mediterranean renewables in Jordan they're all private sector led now we actually think that's a good thing because if we rely on the governments to uh, to raise the funds or on the international community um, then we're beggars and we don't think we we don't think that we should stay there I mean there is less and less money available from the international community, from the generosity of the international community. The beauty of both the desalination and the solar is that they are profitable today. In fact, you know, uh, producing the renewables in Jordan is some of the cheapest in the world, and there's lots of room. Our study shows that if Jordan purchases, if Jordan sells these quantities of uh, uh, renewables, its economy is increased by three to four percent, becomes the single largest industry, and Jordan turns into this major exporter, um, job creation, and, and so forth. Now, the, the challenge of it being private sector-led, of course, is regulation. And the regulation has to be in place. The governance needs to be in place. I can say that from the 20 years, uh, so since 2005, since desalination has, te has been uh, uh, built in Israel, the regulation, the governance is extremely strong. And, and uh, I think we are seeing the results that we need. It doesn't mean that, uh, that we mustn't stay alert, 
But the challenge is where the governance is weak. And, you know, uh, you know th there needs to be support of the international community to make sure that governance will be strong on the solar side in Jordan, on the desalination side in Palestine, so that the public interest always wins out. Rick. So I'd like to pick up on, on something that you said, but, but, but come back to something that Nada said first. Um, but, but, but first of all, thank you both very much for, for, for participating today and, and, and Dana to the Institute for, for, for hosting um, and you for, for moderating. Um, Nada, you spoke eloquently about the courage that it has taken you, your colleagues, Gidon and his colleagues, and your, uh, your co-Jordanian uh, director, Yana, and her colleagues in Amman in the face of, of criticism from many in, um, in, in, in your, your jurisdictions. Um, when the European Coal and Steel Community was founded, there was a lot of criticism among the French and Germans and others in Europe to, to, to that development. And it took a lot of courage for those leaders uh, to, uh, to form the European Coal and Steel Community. And it's taken a number of steps in the European project to get where Europe is today. Can the Green Blue Deal be done in an incremental way. Um, interdependence, I know, is one of your goals. And those of us who care about peace and security recognize that interdependence will promote peace and security. But it's also a threat, and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's frightening to people. Can the project be done incrementally, um, or does it require a certain amount of scale initially? So that was the first of a two-part question. The second question is financing. And you know, you talked about it, and you, you alluded to this being self-financing. That, that I, I don't mean self-financing, but I mean that it, it doesn't require donor assistance, that this is not going to be a, a charitable project, but rather a profitable project for those who invest. How much is required? Um, what, what are we talking about in, in, in dollar terms? Um, at least for the first stage, and then ultimately to, to fulfill the entire ambition of the project, and where do you envision that, that money coming from? Uh, Nada, why don't you start? I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll take the first question, uh, and, and you can continue, Bidon. Uh, definitely, uh, it, it requires, we, we, do, we do stand uh, in, 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 uh, in front of you know, all the opposing uh, voices. Um, and we, as I mentioned, we keep advocating and we keep working with stakeholders to convince them. Um, it took uh, definitely uh, courageous leaders to strike the deal of the Coal and Steel Agreement. Uh, it just required two same people to sit on the table and, um, and strike this deal and move it forward. Uh, unfortunately, what uh, we see missing uh, during our times um, uh, are basically courageous leaders to, uh, uh, to grant us this opportunity to move forward. Um, we, needed, we need someone like uh, uh, Rabin and Yasser Arafat to stand up and to uh, tell the world, world that this is, this is the way forward and this is what we are approaching. Unfortunately, we... Um, we, we are, on all sides, uh, we're disappointed uh, with the, the current status of freezing, of the current status of um, not moving forward on anything. Um, and, and we believe that the only way to move forward and to encourage our leaders is not only by, by talking and by speaking to them and making all these roundtable discussions and, and all these conferences, but basically by doing things on ground to showcase the feasibility of the issue and to showcase uh, that um, it, it does really have um, political, environmental, and socio-economic sense what we're trying to propose and what we're trying to promote, uh, and particularly the water energy nexus. Um, we need to build on existing uh, um, opportunities and existing realities uh, today.
today there is a Tripitanian Israeli peace agreement which could achieve wonders in terms of exchanging uh, uh, water and energy. Uh, today there is uh, um, an ongoing cooperation between the Palestinian uh, and the Jordanian government in terms of uh, importing uh, energy from Jordan. And we would like to capitalize on that in terms of, um, as you've mentioned, uh, Rick, uh, we can't do everything altogether, but we can showcase uh, some small steps in terms of improvement. And in terms of, for instance, um, importing renewable energy instead of uh, uh, conventional energy from Jordan to, to Palestine. This is one step that we are trying to, to promote on both sides. Um, showing these little steps and the feasibility of those steps being led by private sector companies, um, not solely by, uh, by donor funding or by government funding, um, it could basically encourage uh, our leaders and political leaders to look at the bigger picture um, and, and start uh, basically planning um, strategically towards climate change uh, mitigation and, um, and uh, adaptation measures for the entire region. Um, Gidon, do you want to, to take uh, yes. more? Yes, uh, just a little bit. I, I'd say that we're the mother of, in of incrementalism. I mean, you know, we, we've, we've experienced the all or nothing approach and that hasn't moved forward. So, so incrementalism, in fact, is the experience in other conflict areas. Northern Ireland, um, things didn't happen overnight. They moved in an incremental way. Why did we take the all or nothing approach is a little bit beyond me. Um, uh, and, and that's reflected also in the Green Blue Deal. So, you know, we see the water energy nexus chapter as the one that the private sector can lead first. Um, it's not, it doesn't require conditionality. We can move forward on the water energy. That helps us to move forward on the others as well. Um, and the scale, that's the beauty of, of both uh, renewables and desalination. You can, you know, uh, we're, we're seeing that the, there's an interest in a first giga investment in renewables. That's a thousand Make, uh, that's a lot of energy, but the potential is probably 7 to 10 giga from Jordan moving west. So we, we can start with, with a, a giga, which already would be a, a really a, a large project, that, that the uh, private sector uh, can finance because it's bankable. Pe people are, are actually going to, uh, the investors will earn a considerable return. Uh, and, and that's a game changer. Similarly, on the desalination, you know, the needs of um, of, of Jordan, and, and clearly, uh, we're not talking about you know uh, being wholly dependent. Israel and Palestine will not be wholly dependent on Jordan for their renewables, and Jordan will not be wholly dependent on Israel and Palestine for their water. The governments are going to have to strike that balance as to what is what they're comfortable. But there's also an understanding that they cannot meet their needs without that interdependency. And that interdependency replaces domination, because that's what we have at the moment. There's, a, there's, not, there's dependence, and dependence creates a level of uncomfort. Um, interdependency enables both sides to, or all sides, to feel that they're a little bit more equal. And, and that, that sense of equality is critical. In the, in, in the geopolitics of our region. Thanks. We have a representative of the Jordanian embassy here. Um. Um, first of all, thank you, Gidon, for the presentation, and I regret missing the first part of it. I, uh, I've known Gidon uh, for over six years now, I can say, and also for one. And um, I was a diplomat in uh, Dublin before serving the embassy in London, and I uh, heard the tour with ECOPs on both sides, the Jordanian side and, and, and the Israeli side. And I can say, from what I saw, we have to act fast. There is also, uh, I don't know if we don't just touch upon this, there is also a, pop a population drop in the region. We are one of the most fertile uh, regions in, 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 when it comes to population drop. And the most of uh, our population is made up of youth. So uh, if we don't act now in, in a matter of 10 years or so, I think it, the situation will worsen in, in our region in terms of water production. Jordan is number two. Uh, for 
worldwide, the most uh, most the most scarce uh, country in terms of uh, uh, water share per capita. As Bilal mentioned, we get water. That's true. We get water once a week, uh, and, and past in the past summer we got this work uh, once every two weeks because of the drought. So uh, yeah, I hope uh, this initiative moves forward and. Uh, I, I think there is a glimpse of hope. Um, uh, the Israeli government, as as mentioned, as uh, you don't mention, has provided Jordan with the biggest uh, deal, the 50 million cubic meter deal. That's uh, the first time in, in, since we, I think, we signed the peace agreement, if I'm not mistaken. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, that's it. So I wish you all the best, guys. And uh, from what I've seen, again, I, I need to reiterate this: we have to act fast. We have to do something about the environment. It, that bypasses all borders and all points. Thank you. Um, well, we're 15 minutes over time, but I would take one more comment or question if anybody has one. Um, and if not, and seeing none, um, let me just say, um, you know, this has been really fascinating for me. Uh, I think it's... I'm, I'm pleased that this was this was a somewhat more practical and given all the you know you know climactic and political um, uh, con uh, threats that we face uh, in, a, in, a, in a in a funny way one of the more hopeful meetings I've 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 um, chaired so I'm, I'm and I hope I'm not exaggerating <laughs> the hopefulness but um, certainly very inspiring. Uh, and so I'm glad it was my first meeting post-pandemic to chair in person. And I want to thank all of you for, part for participating and just ask you to join me in thanking our two speakers.